I kind of feel bad because everything that Jay just said, like, feel free to talk to me, like, you know, if you have questions. Because <laughs> I, I, I feel, I feel weird when I'm stuck in, uh, you know, I, let it be open. If you feel like you want to say something, even if it's something bad against me, maybe it's something I need to hear. So who knows? And I may take off my shoes or kill me. <laughs> um, so when Joe asked me, asked me to speak here, and he was um, talking about like, okay, my life journey and everything else, it's, it was interesting to me because um, I, I speak a lot about my life. You know, for, for those, I, you know, my friend Tom here like comes to my meditation class and everything, I'm always using examples from my life and from my story um, of my life. But what's interesting is that it kind of came to this weird head because now I was, I'm supposed to come here in front of people that I never met and I'm supposed to tell them my life story and I've come to a point where I'm kind of tired of my story, you know, and, but that's actually a good place to be. And when Joe told me to speak, it's, it's interesting because, um, he told me to speak and we were supposed to do it like a, a few weeks ago, if you guys remember, you know, or even like a month ago, I don't know. And um, it got canceled. But what's interesting to me about it is that when it got canceled, to me inside, I felt like it's because it, I felt, I know the weather, whatever, but I wasn't ready to speak to you yet. And even now, like when I'm speaking, I can feel it. Like I feel it very powerfully coming down that it brings tears to my eyes. Because what's important and what's going to come out of my mouth is not my story. And I know what brings everybody here is because they want to hear. You know, yeah, I know it's funny, like this Italian guy and all these stories and whatever, and all these things, and I'm loud and whatever. But it's actually what's beneath it. And that's the important thing. So it's it more, I'm more interested in your stories. And then after those stories, let them go. And what I see in my practice as wanting to be a, a healer is... Everyone has their stories, and we're clinging on to these stories. But underneath these stories, there's something else. Something far more... I, I want to say the word beautiful, because I use that a lot, but I don't even think it, that's the word. I don't have a word to describe what it is. But all I can tell you is that it's there. But it's, I only feel it when I get out of my way. When the story ceases to exist for me anymore. So all the stories of my past that led me to this very moment now, it kind of means nothing anymore. And the story of what's going to happen to me, what's going to happen to my son, all these things, when that goes away, it's, it's what's left. And the reason why I feel like that's so important, because it's coming to me very, very strongly. Before I even came down here, I was sitting and praying, and I was crying, because I could feel it, because I said, if I could tell you one thing, I want to tell you like it's, you're never going to see me again. I want to tell you as if I'm speaking to my son for the last time. And all I want to tell you is don't get caught up in it. Don't get caught up in your story. And the beautiful, um, right, a few days ago I was listening to this thing about Meister Eckhart. And they said his, when they were persecuting him, um, one of his students was talking to his persecutors. And they said, the problem is, is that he's speaking to you from eternity. But you're listening to him from a place of time. And that's the difference. So everything I'm telling you, when I start talking about my story and everything else, it's coming from that place. But what's more important is go to that place outside of that time. And that place is only here. It's only now. And I can't... I can't make you see it on your own because it's not a place of intellect. And that's the hard part is because I always want to intellectualize everything. But when I let go of it, it makes sense. And then when I come back, I want to try to intellectualize it again. But then I let go of it and I come back again. And all I'm asking you is let go of it just for a little bit. You know, let's be like little kids. That's all, that's it. And if there's anything, and maybe I'm telling you guys this because it's the center of mysticism, <laughs> right? So what's mysticism? It's not somebody that we have powers or, or all of these things. Because the truth is, is that any of, you, any of you can learn to be a channeler. We can all be psychics. We can all be any of these things, you know? 
but it's to be a, a real person. You know, and lately I've been thinking about like a lot of people around me in my circle, they've been talking about like aliens and things of that nature. So I tried to put my, I tried to pretend that I'm an alien and I came to this earth for the first time. And I was doing that while I was walking at my dad's nursery and I started to look at the grass and I would look at it. Like I was looking at it like I didn't understand it. You know, I looked at it without what I think grass is yet. You know, so I would look at it. Well, if I talk to it, will it respond? What, how about if I do this? If I touch it, does it feel, does it get hurt? And what happens is, I started to look at that blade of grass the way a little kid looks at it, without any of the, the attachment to, you, to it yet. And when you get, get to that place, the grass becomes something different. It becomes, yeah, something different. And I'm not claiming to say, to come here and be like, oh, I know something. I don't. I actually, when I start talking about myself, you'll see I'm just this guy walking around. I don't know what I'm doing really. You know, and I just, all I'm doing is trying to do, you know, trying to be what I'm, I'm, what I am, you know. And most of my journey is basically trying to find out what I was. And now that I feel like, okay, I see what I am, now let me let that go too. And now let me, whatever, Wherever I came out of, let it just manifest. But the same way through you, the same way through you, through you, through you. We're all men, it's so nice. It's like we're looking at each other, the same thing, looking at each other. You know? And I can't, I don't know how to make people see it. But all I can say is that it's real. You know, I, I heard a saying also the other day that just because little kids don't understand reasoning, Adults just stop being reasonable. But it's the same thing with that. Just because someone may not understand what we're talking about, or at least what I'm talking about, (laughs) you know, it doesn't mean that it's not real. You know, and I can see it. Even now when I'm looking across the room and I'm looking in some of your eyes, I can see you feel it. You can feel it. And it's not because I'm doing hypnotism or anything. All I'm doing is expressing something outside of myself. But that thing that's coming out is the same thing in you, and that's what's coming out of your eyes. And that's what's connecting us. And all the rest of it is just fun, it's just experience. But go to that place. And it doesn't matter when you're in a good day, it doesn't matter when you're at your worst. You go to that place and you'll see that, yeah, the good, yeah, it's, it's nice. The bad, yeah, it's not that bad. You know, even when you're feeling anxious, when the doctor tells you some bad news, it's, it, to me it's like wizardry. You know, they're telling you things and they're making you believe it. But if you break away from that, you'll see. It's something different. So with that, <laughs> let's talk, yeah, go ahead, Tom. So, Tom, how do you, how do you get to that? How do you? Well, uh, that's a good, thank you for asking that, Tom. <laughs> He, this guy is like a huge uh, blessing in my life because he keeps me on track. <laughs> so, actually, um, it was nice because before I came down here, um, I was just reading some things because to me, one, one thing that I do and something that comes to me, I might ask someone for a tissue. Um, oh, thank you. It's used. No, I'm joking. Um, no, I'm joking. Um, what I found was um, meditation is a great thing, right? Uh, because it helps you to go inwards. But what I've learned was, it's just a technique. You know, there's many different styles of meditation. And tell you the truth, I know, like in the paper and stuff, they, med- they advertise me as a meditation teacher. I went like that because the paper's behind you. I'm a <laughs> um, but the truth is, is that um, if you want to learn meditation, there's a lot probably better people f- to learn from. You know, but what I've learned is the intention of why you're going into meditation. You know, so that's where I start from, is why do I do anything that I'm doing? And sometimes my meditation, you go there and you sit for an hour, you know, and that's what you try to do, because I do it because or else my mind is going all over the place. That's one of the reasons why I practice. But when I'm practicing for the purpose of that connection, it comes from somewhere else. And the way I do it is by just sitting there, and I start, I always start for me, is by being thankful. 
Because I, for myself, I feel being thankful about things is very easy. Because I felt like I had a good life. You know, if, if I'm, something happened to me right now, I feel like, you know what, I had a pretty good life. I had a great family. Um, you know, and all these things. So I always start by that. I always start like, you know, I'm, I'm so thankful for this, for that. And, and I, and I thank all my teachers that are alive and they're not alive. You know, like, to me, like I always talk about St. Francis. Like, to me, he's a teacher. I never met him in person. But to me, he was a teacher, even though he lived so long ago. When he, when I read about him, his actions or what he said, they, they touch something in me. And when, with that, it's like that little drop. And with that drop, that's what I use. And then it's like, do, and then it's like you feel your, my heart, I feel like my heart goes like this. And even sometimes my mind can still be going, but it doesn't do anything. It's like I don't attach to it anymore because I go here. And then little by little, it kind of just goes away and this goes bigger. But the problem is when the mind gets involved, it goes bloop, like that. You know, and, and, and for me, the trick is not to get too involved with that. You know, and when it happens, it happens. Before it will be like, oh man, I got to do my technique harder. But what I found is, it's better to be like the water in those cases that flows. When I'm you're, when I'm too hard with my thoughts, I get stuck, I get stagnant, and that's something I learned also from Chinese medicine later on. Um, so something that I, I would like to share that is actually a part of the rule of Saint Francis, not Saint Francis of Assisi, Saint Francis of Paola. That's He's a different saint. Um, he's probably not as well, well, I mean, obviously he's not as well known as St. Francis, everyone knows him, but St. Francis of Paola was, um, he was born in Calabria. That's why he's so famous to me, is because that's where my family was from. And um, he was kind of, a, he was a hermit that lived in, um, on, on like the coast of a town called Paola. And when he was born, he had, he had an issue with his eye, and his parents were very devout of St. Francis of Assisi, and they prayed to him and this and that, and then uh, he healed. So they said, because of that, when he got old enough, they would send him to stay in a monastery, one of uh, a Franciscan monastery for a year, which he did. And then when he came back, he kind of went into solitude, and he became a hermit. And um, he's, he's very well famous. Like He ended up having to go to France, and he stayed with, I forgot what king. And like you know, he did all these things. He was very... He was a, a very well-known healer and did all these miracles and this and that. But the thing that I love about him, more than the, the, the stories of his famous miracles, that's what, what we all grew up knowing about him, is when this book, there's only a few several books written about him, and they're not even the great, but this one is written by one of his disciples. It just says an anonymous disciple of, uh, that was alive during his time and was one of his uh, brothers. Um... He just kind of wrote like things about his life, like random things. And it's not like a story, just like kind of random. But at the end, he writes some of the things that one of the rules that when they became their own order, iminimi, which means kind of like lesser than, which means, you know, the Franciscans were poor and then they're even poor. You know what I mean? It's like such a Southern Italian thing to do. You know what I mean? No, you're going to be poor. I'm going to be even poorer than you. So, but, but one of the things I love is in the, in his rule, he says, um, about prayer, he says, do not fail to persevere with all your might in prayer and devotion. And he says, with, when you pray, unite to your words meaning. To that meaning, a heartfelt re- resonance. To this resonance, enthusiasm. And to enthusiasm, balance. And to balance, humility. And to humility, a genuine freedom of spirit. And I, I feel like if I walk out of here right now, that sums up everything that I feel like I want to say. Because really, um, another great thing that I heard once was, if you learn a hundred m- methods of meditation, at the end you should know a hundred and one. Because the way I connect is going to be different than the way you connect. Right? Because you're a different manifestation of creation than, than I am. You know? And for me, if I pick up a book of Rumi or... Sometimes just seeing like a, a bird, like a, a bird flying around. There's something about it that just like, it just hits me and it opens me up, you know. But who knows? Maybe for like the scientist when they're looking through their telescope and they're looking at these things and the order of the stars, maybe that does it to them. Maybe it just opens something up. So maybe that scientist that's very intellectually minded is a mystic as well and probably even a greater mystic, you know. 
So there's never one way. But for me, is I, I'm always about things of the heart. That's why you saw it. I knew you guys two minutes and I cried already. You know what I mean? It's a shame for my wife. <laughs> about a tough guy. Yes? Well, was there some sort of uh, <clears throat> tragedy or catastrophe that occurred in your life that helped you get to the journey? No, uh, um, I know. I kind of feel like it would be, it, it would be more um, entertaining if there was. But... <laughs> You know, no, I mean the, the truth, but, but the truth is that it, it, there really wasn't. It's kind of like, uh, I grew up in a Catholic household. Hey, and <laughs> <that is. laughs> No, but the, the truth is, is like, yeah, I, I don't know. I, I feel like, um, you know, gr- growing up, I had a very y- large family. So there's that part of you that wants to... Um, I don't think that's appropriate. What's that? You put down oh, no, no. oh, no, no, I'm not putting it down. Oh. You see why now I said don't be interrupting. <laughs> oh no no that's good that's good I mean that's fine. This crew can get out of hand. <laughs> <laughs> so I, I grew up in a, a very large Italian and uh, Catholic family, and um, so I, I mean I don't know why I was always pulled to the things of that nature. Like to, when I became an altar boy, I thought it was the coolest thing in the world. You know when I put on those robes, I thought I was like the man. You know, and it's not like I walked around like, hey, look at me. But to me, I felt like this was awesome. You know, and I don't know. I, I, so for whatever reason, just naturally, like I said, for naturally, that's the way I, I just kind of went, you know. And growing up, even going back to the Catholicism, when, when I was in high school, I did grow a huge problem with Catholicism because I was in that... Obviously, I'm a teenager, and I'm exploring things, and I'm looking, and I was questioning things. And when I didn't get the answers that I wanted, you get, you get frustrated. But at the same time, that's what I was talking to with the, the pastor here. What's it, Colin? Cliff. Cliff, sorry. Um, with Cliff about is that sometimes that, that's not a bad thing, because it's that pressure that, it's that, pressure that kind of helps you polish. You know, it's that suffering that polishes you. You know, and... I didn't have like a specific thing like, you know, I got in a very tragic car accident and I had this near-death experience. I did have an experience um, when I was in my early, I mean, um, early 20s playing with a Ouija board, which was probably a very stupid thing to do. And, and but at the same time, it was a very great experience. At the end of it, it was a very great experience. And I even remember that, like me, me and it was like uh, two of my cousins and my cousin's girlfriend at the time. And we even went to the priest to tell him. And he actually looked more scared than I was. You know what I mean? And when he, I saw his face scared, I was like, I'm in trouble. <laughs> you know? But even with that, at that time in my life, I kind of felt like I went away from, I won't say religion. I, find, I kind of felt like I was trying to go away from anything that drove me spiritually. And when this came along, this story, which is a very long story. Um, even with that, when things started to get like really crazy and, and weird and scary, was I got down in the middle of my room crying. And I called every Catholic saint you can imagine. I'm Padre Pio, um, St. Francis, this, that, everybody. And then, of course, obviously, Jesus, had, you know, the big guy. Um, you know, and it did change, you know. And what I found was, in my life, that there are things of darkness and light. They do exist. But what I also found is, why be scared of darkness? Because it's the darkness that actually helped me see light. The darkness, you know, someone said to me once that, the angels are trying to help you, but if you don't listen, then it's when they tell the demons, they go, go, go beat this guy up, so he learns his lesson. And in a, little, in a way, that's how I feel sometimes. Is that I don't I don't like to le- learn the easy way, so I got to learn the tough way, and it doesn't mean like anything. Tra- like I never got involved with drugs or anything like that. My suffering was always here, you know, always thinking about things that didn't matter, worrying about things that really didn't matter, of trying to break out of this shell of what I thought I was, you know. And I was telling Joe, actually today when you know the newspaper they did a thing that I was going to talk here, for me it was a big deal because um, I don't really talk about this part of myself outside of really my meditation class. I don't tell anybody. And my wife posted it online. And she asked me, do you want me to post it? I said, no. But then when I reflected of why I was 
so um, against posting it, it's because of of that feeling of I, I'm, I have to protect this part of myself. And when I realized that, I said, yeah, you know what, go ahead and post it. And she posted it, and all of a sudden, do, 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 all these people were liking it. People from my large Italian community, liking it, putting the hearts and you know, all those emojis. And to me, I couldn't believe it. Like I was telling Joe, I felt like it was like a coming out party. You know what I mean? No, really, because it's like I was hiding something about my, myself, you know? And now it's like there's no more hiding. Like there's a camera in front of my face and like, okay, this is, this is what I am, you know? And when I, when I really look back, it's the intellectual, intellectualized Paolo, the rational Paolo, trying to protect this one. But in reality, this one doesn't need protection. You know why? Because this one has seen darkness and has seen light. And between both of them, he knows there's something in between. And he knows when this he dissolves. You know, God lets it rain on the just and the unjust. God lets the sun set and shine on the just and the unjust. But if you go to that place in between, or, or not between, maybe further, I don't know the word. You guys understand what I'm saying. It's different. So I can't judge anything, you know. I would never, I would never say something like Catholic, Catholicism is bad, because it's not. Because look at all such great mystics that came out of it. You know, but also look at so many other religions of these great mystics that came out of it. I, I have no, I have no say in condemning anything in this life. Anything. Because out of everything, something beautiful came out of it. You know? I can go through every race and I'll pick out somebody that I feel like is a huge inspiration in my life. I just said Rumi. Rumi was Persian. You know, St. Francis was Italian. You know, that's a, that's a gimme. <laughs> you know what I mean? But, you know, Meister Eckhart. Well, I don't know what he was. Was he German? German. You know, German. You know, you can go anywhere and you'll, you'll find it. Baba Moyadin was this great Sufi. Baba Moyadin? Yeah. Get out of here. He's a huge impact on my life. Huge. And Baba Moyadin, I'll tell you a quick story about him. I had no clue who this guy was. No clue. But my, my wife is Iranian. So when we got married, um, I wanted to go to Iran. But obviously, they're not going <laughs> to let me. So I said, well, if we write down on the papers that I'm a Muslim, we'll go. So who's going to do that, right? So <laughs> it comes the Baba Moedin Fellowship. And we got married at the fellowship. And I, I, I still didn't even know what it was. But when I was leaving, the man gave me a little book, this book, of um, A Million Lives, what's it called? No, I, I forget the name. It's like something, um, uh, no, enough for a million years, it's called. Little book, this big. And I just kept it in my bathroom, I'll be honest with you. And it was this big, and I kept it next to a book by Anthony DeMello, a Jesuit priest. And, they, cause, and the only reason they were together, because of the same size. <laughs> Is it the only reason. But you know what, one day I'm sitting there, you know what I mean, doing what I'm doing. I pulled it out, and I'm reading it. And it's, right away it hit me. Like, who is this guy? What is this guy? I thought it was going to be Muslim stuff. You know what I mean? But it wasn't. It used Islamic terminology, but it was speaking. And you know what the funny thing is? If you get the same, the Anthony DeMello book, and you opened it up, and if you just change the, the words, they're almost exactly the same book. That's the, the message is exactly the same. Exactly. So I was, who was this guy? And then... Uh, this is a few years ago. Then years later, um, I, I, I went to the... Um, I'm trying to think back exactly when it was. It doesn't matter, I guess. <laughs> so I really started getting into um, what he would say. Because to me, he, he never spoke about a specific religion or nothing. All he cared about is that connection. He always talks about your heart. And going back to what Tom said about how, how do you connect, that's what he always talks about. He always talks about that. And then I actually went to where he was buried, which is in Pennsylvania. And I met up with a guy that was a part of the fellowship that does like art for like roomy books or something like that. Not, not him. Not him. The guy that does the illustration. So I, I spoke with him 
And he was saying, I said, well, you were close friends, you, you were close with Bawa Mu'ideen while he was alive. I said, what did you, um, like, how did you guys practice? What kind of meditation did you do? He goes, oh, no. Because in the beginning, we didn't do any of that. He would just talk. And I said, but then what happened? He says, because then people wanted more. They said, well, how do we do that? He goes, all right, let's wake up in the morning and we'll start doing the, the I guess, the, the prayers. I, I don't know the words. So we started doing that. But then people were falling asleep. So then we, we started doing that. So he was actually tailoring it for other people. But then I, there comes a certain point where those people will have to tear that away too. And go back to here. And that's what, that's what I love when I read what he says. He's always going back to here. And it, it's interesting is that I was supposed to talk, speak here and it got canceled. And then after that, I had a dream of Baba Moyadin. But younger, his, the beard, the little beard thing that he has was black. And I saw him walking on this little wall. And I saw him and I went up to him. I said, teacher, teacher, all happy. And I hugged him and I embraced him and he embraced me. And he said, no, you, he never called me by name, but he said, you see, he goes, no matter what lifetime, we always, we always end up uh, seeing each other, he said. And then he took me and he st- started to talk to me exactly the way I'm talking to you. And that's why I believe it was supposed to be today. I was speaking to him. He was speaking to me just like I was speaking to you. And then after that, he took me by the hand and he took me into a room where he started to treat somebody to do acupuncture, at least what I thought was acupuncture. And there was a table, uh, I mean, uh, a wall made out of little flashlights. And then he started getting the flashlights and he started, I, I'm going to try to stay in the camera, but he started like throwing the flashlights around like this on the floor. I was like, what the, what's this guy doing? He's making a mess, right? And he was doing that, one like here, one like here, and I'm picking it up, picking it up. And he said, Paolo, when you're with somebody, you have to be over here. You has to be clean. It has to be focused. Because I was getting so upset about the, the flashlight like being this, this mess. And I was saying, you're doing this mess. He's not putting his attention on the patient. But what he taught me was something very important, you know? Yes. Yeah, I guess you, I mean I, I I didn't know how to really interpret it. My my the interpretation I took of it was the the lights was a little piece. Even when I'm talking to you, I'm a, I'm giving you like these little pieces of light, but I'm not the light. You know, and if I, I guarantee you right now, if I step off stage and I say Tom, come upstairs. I mean, come up. <laughs> Come on stage. He's going to walk up, but because it's clean slate, he didn't prepare nothing and listen to that, I guarantee you it'll come. And a message will come out that's different. It's a piece of the light. It's a piece of it. And the reason why I went to even go meet this uh, Baba Moyadeen is because one day in meditation, I was meditating and th- th- it, all these things those that happen for a reason. The day that I, I met Joe in Doylestown to talk about me doing this. That day when I went home and I, I was walking my, I have two goats, I was walking my goats and I was sitting down to meditate. <laughs> Were you laughing at that? <laughs> and, uh, we, and I was walking um, and I was meditating, I could feel something very, very, so powerful that it makes me cry the way I, w- I was crying earlier. And I said, what are you? And it said, I am Razul. And I thought, what is that, like a Batman character? Like, that's how I felt. Because my intellectual mind is trying to stop it. And exactly what he said was, uh, Archangel Michael, Miguel, he said, uh, Miguel is here in front of you. Raphael is, in, is inside of you. He said, San Francesco permeates all things because he permeates through Christ, which is in all things. That was exactly the introduction. And when I went home, I googled this name Razul, and what came up was a connection to this Bawa Moyadin, and it kind of terrified me, because like, I was like, what's going on here? And that's when I went to, I started calling people uh, to find out, and that's when I went up to uh, where he was buried to go meet with people, because to, to, to validate, it's weird, it's like a, 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 you know, a spiritual Scooby-Doo or something, you know what I mean? <laughs> My goods are Scooby-Doo. <laughs> yeah. Um, thanks. Um, so, but, but why? Like, like, I feel like, why would that come through me? I'm this little Catholic guy. You know what I mean? But you know why? It's because our heart. And that's the difference. The heart. 
And the reason I'm speaking to you today is because there's a reason. And it's your heart. It's your heart. And I feel it, I feel it so hard. And I'm not, like I said, I'm not those southern preachers that are saying this and that. I just know what I feel. And if I'm wrong, I'm wrong. But every time I followed my gut, or every time I followed my heart, I should say, it always worked out better for me. You know? I spent most of my life doing all these things. I met a girl, and she moved to Italy. And then it happened. Go to Italy. I never left my family. I never went anywhere. The first, the farthest I went was Wildwood. You know? So I, I went to Italy. And then I got there, and it didn't work out. And actually, before I left, there was a woman that I know that does like uh, tarot card readings. And, you know, I just know her. And before she left, you know, she came up to me. And she, I didn't even ask for the reason. She said, you know, you're probably going to cheat on her, or she's going to cheat on you. But no matter what, don't worry, it's going to be good for you. And I went, what do, you, what do you think when you're young and, you know, you're in love? Okay, buddy. You know, and you went. But that's what exactly happened. You know what I mean? But it worked out for the best, for her and for me. Because if she didn't do what happened, I wouldn't have came home. And if I didn't come home, I wouldn't have went back to the same routines that I was doing. And if I didn't go back to the same routines that I was doing, I would have gotten frustrated. And that energy inside of you starts to build up and build up and it can't take it no more. And when you can't take it no more, that's when it happens. That's when it happens. You know, it's like that story with the teacher... The, kid, the disciple says, oh, I want to know, uh, I want, I want to know God, you know, and, and the disciple, they're bathing in the river, and then he stuffs the guy down the, in the water, and he's gasping for air, and then he comes up, and he's like, you know, gasping for air, he's like, what the hell, man, you know, and he says, when you want God the way you want the air, and then, then you'll say it, then you'll get it. And, th- and that's how I feel it always happened for me. The good thing for me, I feel, is that it doesn't take much. And that's actually one of my prayers all the time. It's like, help me to learn. But, you know, I'm a pretty quick learner. I don't have to suffer that, but don't make me suffer that much. I don't need to suffer that much. (laughs) You know, but even with that, I always say, but what also, and and actually, sometimes, still to this day, I get nervous when I say it, is, but only if it's your will. Because I always, always, and to me, still, the most powerful like prayer that I ever heard is Jesus in the garden. When he knows that his time is up as that being. And he's there, he's scared, he's a human being. And he's like, please let this pass me by, let it go. But only if it's your will. Even in that moment, he's still willing to, that it still makes me cry. And that, what, what I'm saying there, see like how it, it moves me so much, that's, that's the fuel that I use. That's, that's the secret that I have. I don't really have a secret. If there was a secret, that's the secret. Yes? Um, how do you deal with 4 a.m. fears, irrational thoughts, maybe from too much activity in your life, but you have, you're having an irrational compared to the heart. Your intellect being working more than it should. Right. Do you have a prayer, a mantra that you do? No, I, years ago, when I first moved back from uh, Italy, I went through a really hard time with um, anxiety and panic attacks. Um, and I would get like these, those palpitations, you know, all, all those feelings. The only thing that helped with me at that time was, uh, one, I would use, like my, like my cousin used to say to me, use the tools that you have in your toolbox. So one, I would try to sit down and meditate. But because, to me, meditation... I like to think of it as a more of a surrender, but I used more of just, I, I practice a Korean martial art, so I would just do the forms over and over and over and over in my head. So it, it kind of, I was using it as a tool for my mind to grasp something else, to stay on the something else, to keep it grounded basically, to keep myself grounded. But what I've learned later on in life is they're still useful, the tools, but it's also important just to be okay. Like I recognize it, I understand it, it's there. But when you, under, when you recognize that, you're something more than that person with the anxiety. You're something besides that. You, it, there's, it's still there, but you're not connected to it. I don't know if that makes any sense.
has fear eat yes, they have thoughts that in the morning you won't have. You have them at four AM Right. Get up to do your duty. So I mean when you say irrational, I guess it would have to be what is irrational to you. Yeah. You know? They're blown out of proportion. Yeah, I I guess my thing is just noticing that they're there. You know? I, I would just notice that they're there. You know, the, going back to that thing when I said with Razul, you know, it easily, if I was talking to a different group, they would be like, okay, this guy's crazy, right? And the truth is, is that one of your first uh, thoughts are, am I going crazy? And you know what the response was? Yeah, you're crazy as long as you believe that this is crazy. You know? So my, my thing is, even when in meditation, you go to that place where you feel beautiful things. The question is, is which one of it is your mind and which one is not? And what I found is, is not to engage with all of them. Is to always go deeper. Because even where the angels are, and if let's say you're meditating, you come across something so beautiful, you see the angels, it's this and that. I would ask them, I want to go even deeper. Take me to where God is. Go, I want to go deeper than this. And that's how I get past things, is that not to partake in, in all... You, you come to my meditation class, you'll see many gifted people that they see all the great things, you know, and, they, and things that help other people out. You know, I saw this with you, and then it'll, it'll, it'll bring something forth for somebody that, that's very healing many times. But then with that, there's a place where, but now, let's go uh, even deeper. And... And that, that's where I feel like, I guess why, why, you know, we could even talk about that stuff, but I feel what I should be talking about is to even go deeper than that. To go deeper than that place, um, where the, even the angels are. And who knows, there might be some angel going, you know, what an ass, <laughs> this guy, you know. But, yeah. Uh, what I just try to do when I'm in that moment of anxiety, Yeah. What's that? He said. That, he said for him it works to just focus on his breathing. You know. So when you're telling me that you're having, the, or I'm not saying you, but you're saying these irrational thoughts come. Uh, what I get is that your belief is that the thoughts that you're having are irrational and you don't want them. So what I would say is instead of just fighting them, just be like, yeah, okay. And if you want to shift it, that's up to you. Like I said, it's almost like. Uh, like anything, you want to shift something, then what do you do to shift it? Bring the energy down. You know, doing that, focusing on your breath, or, you know, just sitting there, standing, and just focusing on the bottom of your feet. Focus on breathing from the bottom of your feet. You know, you know what makes that difficult, I think, is that we identify with the thought as though that is us. And one of the best ways to deal with that, in my experience, and when I'm dealing with it, is to back up and just look at it. And often I think of myself sitting in a dark movie theater, and there's a screen up there, and those thoughts are passing across the screen, but I'm back here just observing and sometimes, if there's something you can't get rid of, uh, if, you, if you let it go across the screen long enough, it will play itself out. Yeah. Like the old kids' games. Say, think about elephants, you know. All right, how long can you think about it? All right, say, so keep thinking about it, keep thinking. Eventually, your mind will say, I'm tired of thinking about elephants. Yeah. I'm thinking about something else. So, in a way... If, if you step back and become the observer, you're not the thoughts, you're just observing. They will eventually play yeah. themselves out. And that's, you know, for me, one of the heart of, of kind of like what you're talking about is that we're the observer. Yeah, I, I sometimes I feel I'm talking about even going further than that. And letting the observer melt. Yeah. You know? And... Going back to you know what you were saying, something I always talk about, and kind of what I how I always start my meditations is, 
uh, Anthony DeMello talks about uh, the orchestra, the, the symphony of life. And I like to look at it as that uh, I'm in front of a, you know, an or- I went to go see this orchestra and I have a seat and I use my breath as my seat. That's my place at the, at, in the audience. You know, and then everything that's going on, the irrational thoughts is one instrument, but it's only one of the instruments. You know, maybe the little pain in my neck or my knee, that's a different one. The noise I hear outside with the wind, that's another instrument. And they're just playing. And when you sit from that place, if I just focus on the thoughts, it's like listening to the orchestra and all I hear is the violin, you know? But then if I listen to only the violin, I miss the whole orchestra. So I listen to all of it. And it's interesting, like when you do that and you don't, you start letting go of each one and you start hearing it and feeling it, all of it all together, all of a sudden, even the bad stuff kind of becomes nice. Because now it, it, you see it almost plays a part in that moment. You know? And it's only happening in, in that moment. And it's always unique and it's always the same. It's interesting. You know? It's, it's interesting to, to the uh, Center for Contemporary Mysticism and there's speakers and, that come and speak. But we're trying to speak about the unspeakable. You know? And that's what, and I, I like that. I find that beautiful. And that, that's what gets me going. I, I love that. And I love to hear, that's why I say I'm tired of my story. I want to hear other people's stories. Because I know already, it, it, mine's tiring. You know, but what's your story? And hopefully by telling me, you get tired of your own story. <laughs> you know? And then we could just sit there in silence. You know? I want to get to the point where maybe we don't say anything. And we just sit here. And then afterwards, like, right, I'll see you guys next week. You know, because you just feel it. And even, see, even when I'm talking about it, you start to feel like the change in the room. Because it's there. It's always there. You know, it's not somewhere else. You don't have to go anywhere. It's right there, always waiting. It's, it's, like, it's, like, it's like right behind that. And all we got to do is let that curtain go down. And it'll be there. And I'm saying that it's right there. That's how thin it is. It's like that. And we just got to let it down. Yes. Are you talking about love? Yeah, I think so. I, I, I think I, I, I am talking about love. I mean, I feel love is the, the closest word, maybe, to what I'm talking about. Like an energy? Yeah, I, I would say life more than energy. Life. Yeah, I, in you know, Chinese medicine, we talk about qi all the time. Like qi, and everyone says qi is energy. But my te- one, of, one of my um, acupuncture uh, teachers... He talks about, he says, chi is more of a, a, like a resonance, a relationship between things. And maybe I'll go even further, if I may, like I'm like, I'm going to ostracize, but I feel like it's, that's what life is. You know, this is life. When something is dead, we say, oh, there's no more life in it. It's that thing that's con- it's connecting all things, or ever moving. You know? But we can't see it. It's just there. You know? and, and I feel that's why, and that's why I believe things like miracles and all these things that happen to people is because it's always just moving. It's always um, rebirthing itself. You know? And the reason I believe in those things is because if we let down that, that thin, that if we let that down, if we let ourselves out of the way, then life can just move. And move and move. Real quick, I'm going to say something from here that just came. He said, "What his this disciple says? When Francis made peace, I'm sorry. When Francis made peace with himself and with God, he turned his life into a gift. And I mean, here's these people we read about that lived so long ago, and we're still trying to like figure them out more than just like, oh, they were nice guys. You know what I mean, or nice women." But it was, there was something about them. And I feel like my belief is that they let themselves go where life just moved through them. And there's nothing any more special about St. Francis than you. Because if you believe that, then I, I believe that you're very mistaken. Because you exist. And he existed. 
The only difference is, he, he didn't get caught up in himself anymore. You know, he didn't get caught up. And he let himself go. And, and like I know, uh, like Baba Moyadin always talks about, die before you're dying. You know, and that's how I feel. I feel like I've become so tired about myself that I don't care about it anymore. I'd rather it go. You know, I'd rather it go before this goes. And then something else can take its place. But I, I want some, I want life to take my place, not some other ent- entity that has its own wants and its own desires. I want that thing that, that, that life, that ever living, loving life to take over. And when I do that, I become a gift not only to myself, but to everybody. Because I'm a part of you. Because that part that's manifesting now is the same part that's inside of you. And how many great works would we all be doing if we were all working from that area? And it may not all look the same, you know? I feel weird talking in in front of people about this stuff. I know it established that. But for whatever reason, it comes my way all the time. Not all the time, a few times, you know, to, to speak. So, and I don't mind it. I don't get nervous to talk in front of people or anything. So, if that's what, how it manifests through me, then fine. But then maybe for someone else, it's to be that mysterious guy up in the mountains. Or maybe for someone else, it should be, uh, working in an impoverished place and being with those people and showing them that there's still love in the world. You know, like someone like, uh, um, Mother Teresa. Or anything. You know, please, I'm not comparing myself to those people. Like I said, I'm trying. That's all. That's all I can say is I'm trying. But I also feel um, there's not that much to, to do. It's only because we believe there's a lot to do. And you guys are all here. Like I, I feel, I can feel it. And it, it, it just takes that one second. And then you know what? Someone's going to come to you and they're going to ask you, how, how do you do what you do? And then you're going to have to stand there and try to come up some answer like I did. <laughs> you know what I mean? The, you know, and just coming from that place, you know. Oh. Yes? I was playing a sport with uh, somebody. I won't mention the sport that I am a hacker. But uh, <coughs> copper tennis. And it was horrible in the beginning. And then the second nine... He was tremendous. I said, well, what happened? He said, I stopped thinking. Yeah. He was in the zone. Yeah. He was in the zone. And, you know, and that's why, like, when Joe was asking me before about, well, try to stay on at least some of the guidelines, you know, about what I do and this and that. And the reason why I purposely, not that I ignored him, I'm not trying to be disrespectful, <laughs> The reason I do that is because if I put myself on the spot, even though it's scary for me myself to do that, if I put myself on the spot, my head doesn't get in the way. Because I don't know what I'm going to say. So when I do that, I know I get out of the way. And what really wants to come out, I would have never thought, I know if I look at that tape later, but what the hell were you talking about? Why, <laughs> why, why did I, not, not in a bad way, like I didn't know what I was talking about, but why, I would have never thought I was going to start talking about Baba Moyadeen and actually tell you all the things that I thought may have been crazy about myself. I'm going to go tell it to a bunch of strangers and we got it on tape. You know what I mean? So, but why? is because I got out of my own way. You know? And then afterwards, it'll probably come back on the drive home like, oh crap. You know? But then that's just, that's me becoming me again. You know? And then I, I practice or I just let go to go back to that again. And... You know, I heard one time they said, my, my martial arts teacher say, um, to, to, get mar- to get enlightenment is easy, to keep it is difficult. And I know, just speaking, and when I look in many of your eyes, you guys had that feeling of what I was speaking about before. But then we come here because, and we, we nod our heads like, yeah, because then we lose it somehow. But it's always there. It's always there. No, thank you. Since we've had a lot of interchange from the floor, why don't we go now around our tables and 
share a little about what we've heard and how it spoke to us, and how we can resonate, and uh, we'll have Paolo come around and uh, maybe visit the table. Did you have one more question? Yeah. Yeah, to acupuncture. Um, uh, so I answer that real quick? Yeah. Uh, so w- when I was living in Italy, I always had sinus issues. And when I was, li- it's kind of like, a, you know, it's not like a straightforward path. I started using uh, acupuncture in Italy because I had sinus issues growing up. And my doctor here said eventually you're going to need surgery, but I was still young at the time. He said, wait. So when I was about 23 in Italy, they, uh, the doctor's like, yeah, you're going to need surgery. So um, this woman, she looked kind of like a grandmother figure to me. She said, well, try anything else first. And at that time, uh, then I, I ended up doing different things. I went to this uh, acupuncturist, and he told me, he's like, listen, you had this problem your whole life. Don't think one time is going to fix it. He goes, just give me some time. So I went, and I, I was like kind of fascinated by it. Like he was, there was an herb that we use in uh, acupuncture called moxa, and he was like burning it and all this. I'm like, I'm already stuffed up, and this guy's like burning stuff in my face. Like, you know, but, but after a few sessions, I started to notice very subtly that I was like, oh, I'm breathing out of my nose, you know? So I also did like dietary um, changes that he told me. So after that, when I moved back to the States and, and I was landscaping again, um, I, I was still going to an acupuncturist time to time for like my back, if I hurt my back and things of that nature. So um, when I was getting to that point, like something felt like I had to change something. I moved with a friend of mine, a high school friend of mine, into, um, into Doylestown. And while I was there, I said, it's time for me to get back to how I felt in Italy, which was how, who I was, right? So I started doing um, meditation uh, classes there. And not like classes, I was just like whoever wanted to come, we would get together and meditate together. And while we were there, you know, people would tell you, most of the time it was like maybe a few of my cousins or something like that. And um, people would be like, oh, my back hurts, my neck hurts. And I would sit there and, you know, do a little massage or something like that. And I, I wanted to do more. I wanted to learn more. And it fascinated me. So I said, you know, maybe in the winter when I'm slow, I'll take a, a massage course. So I, in the winter, I went to go take a, I went to register for a shiatsu class. And while, while I was there, there was um, a book on Chinese medicine um, by Giovanni Machiocha. He's one of our, like it's a textbook that you get in, in acupuncture school. And I was just looking through it, and it just captured my attention. Like when I was reading it, um, the theories behind the medicine spoke to me so much. Because I felt like it wasn't just this direct thing, like here's your diagnosis, this is what we're doing. It's the way they spoke about the body, it was actually like art to me. And it just spoke to me very much that I closed the book and I just walked out and I said, I'm going to go do acupuncture. You know, so um, I started calling around school, say, what do I need to go to school? Salute. Uh, what I needed to go to school and then um, nothing. Uh, that I just ended up going, you know. Um, but if I didn't listen to that voice that said, go do that, I, I feel like, and again, that's what I'm saying, like, of following your heart is because I felt it so strongly and I was very scared to do it because, you know, all of my, all the male cousins of my family were all, we, we stay in a certain way. And to do that was very scary. You know, it was very, very scary for me. And then, of course, I couldn't just jump into an acupuncture program. You got to do anatomy, physiology, and all these things. And I hadn't been in school for a long time. So I went to go sign up for a chemistry class and I met my wife in line. So actually, you know, even, even if I didn't even finish uh, the school, I still made out, you know what I mean? So, <laughs> so I, I, I met my wife in line, and then, um, you know, we started doing chemistry, and, and, you know, I did all those courses. And then I did those courses, and I'm thinking, crap, I didn't even enter the course yet, and I feel like I'm dying, you know? But then, you, 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 you know, you start going, you start moving. And you, even with that, you know, there was the one school here in Glenside, and I called them up, and, you know, they were a new school at the time. But I started calling different schools, a few schools in New York and this and that. And then when I went to go visit the one in, the one I ended up attending in Montclair, New Jersey, it's like I went in there, I spoke to the dean, and I, I still remember if, like, I mean, I became friends with the lady now at the office, Kelly. Within two seconds, I looked at her, I said, this is a school I'm gonna go to. I'm gonna go to school here. And I walked out. It's because, again, you just felt it. And in a way, I kind of felt angry about it because it was like two hours away. You know what I mean? <laughs> like one institute is like 15 minutes from my house. But 
if I didn't go there, I wouldn't have met like some of the greatest friends that I met through school. You know what I mean? Or I didn't learn. Um, maybe who knows? Maybe it's karma. I don't know. Maybe I needed to work hard. I, you know, I come from a very good Italian family. You know, where we always helped each other out. We always. And for me to break out of that, maybe that's what I needed, is that to show that dedication, like, no, get in the car, you're going to drive two hours, and then you're going to come back two hours. And then you're going to... So maybe it was something that I got out of that as, as well. You know, I, I needed, the, again, I needed that, that struggle to kind of like peel those layers off, you know. And it was nice, you know something, I've only seen a, a, a bald eagle a few times in my life. One time was when I f- took my first anatomy class and we had to do sketches of anatomy. And my teacher told, I'm the worst drawer. If you ever saw me draw, it would be funny. So I was uh, drawing, um, you know, doing the femur, the femur and all that. So she told me to practice on doing leaves and things you find in nature. So again, I'm walking the goats one time and I hear this br- in the brush and this beautiful two bald eagles land in, the, in this tree. One takes off and one just stayed there for like 20 minutes. And I called my, my dad, my father, you got to come. Look, there's the hawk, uh, eagle. Of course, by the time he gets there, it's gone, right? But that was the first time. You know, I saw another one again, driving up to my graduation. It makes me cry. Gra- driving to my graduation. And then the other day, Thursday, I took my son to a park in Dawestown. And my son says, Papa, look, eagle. And he says eagle about almost everything. Like, you know, I look up and it was a bald eagle. And then to this morning, we're doing Qigong. I told them that story that I saw the thing. And Tom says, look, and it was a bald eagle. And to me, they were all, to me, even to, for you guys, this is just a small gathering that you guys probably do every week or whatever. To me, this was a big deal. You know, it, because it's another layer of peeling off so I can go to who I am. And I hope and I pray that by doing that, by exposing this, that then you expose who you are too. And then through that, we can go about this world. You know? well, thank you. Oh, thank you.